Thank you so much, Abdullah. That was a, a very kind and very generous introduction. Uh, it's my pleasure to get to talk to you all this evening. Um, so the topic that I'm going to try and talk to you about is Pez Cavus. It's quite a complex topic. Um, and to understand Pez Cavus properly, we actually have to know an awful lot about the foot and ankle. So I'm going to try and go through that as best I can. This is going to be at the level for those sitting the FRCS exam. And if anybody has any specific questions at the end, we can go through that. So Pez Cavus. Cavus is a descriptive term which just talks about how high the arch is in the foot, uh, but it covers a whole host of different foot shapes. It's often associated with a varus position of the hind foot, and it may also be associated with an equinus. To understand it properly takes excellent three-dimensional anatomy, several mechanical models all in your head at one time, and also a great deal of flexibility of thought. So to understand how the foot works, we're going to look at multiple different mechanical models as we go through, but to understand how a normal foot works, when a normal foot requires going up onto the tiptoes to allow you to push off, uh, the tibialis posterior fires along with the gastroc and soleus through the Achilles, and as the heel comes up, it swings around the subtalar joint and it inverts. This does two things. The first thing it does is it stretches the plantar fascia around the metatarsal heads, pulling them around a further distance, uh, and that tensions the plantar fascia, but it also locks the Chopin joint. So this is windless mechanism, which we'll go through again shortly, uh, but windless mechanism is something that's very commonly talked about in the foot and ankle, and you can see that the pitch at the bottom, the way when we go up onto our tiptoes, it actually tensions the plantar fascia, which shortens the distance between the metatarsal head and the calcaneum, and that actually tensions the whole sole of the foot and turns something that's very floppy and supple when it lands on the floor and something that's rigid and allows us to push off. This inversion of the hind foot through the plantar fascia and tip post locks the mid portion of the foot and actually makes it more rigid, allowing us to push off. So cavo varus, I want to just say right at the start, is a condition of stiffness, which is the complete opposite of a flat foot, which nine times out of ten is a condition of floppiness. Cavo varus can be a normal shape of the foot. So a lot of people have a resting cavo varus position. Uh, when the foot is not on the floor, you will see that some people have a high arch and a varus position of the hind foot. And it can also be advantageous. Many sports players and those that are quick at running will actually have a mild cavo varus. This foot, every single foot is completely individual and you must approach it as a 3D puzzle that you have to solve to figure out the treatment specific and bespoke to that patient's foot. Try and consider the following as you go through any 3D deformity such as a cavo varus. So that will include trying to think as you go through the examination about the cause of the cavo varus, the deformity from top to bottom, and also those corrective options. And this is what we talk about in the exam as higher order thinking. And this is exactly what you have to do when you're a consultant. When you see a patient, as soon as you start seeing that patient, you're actually thinking about your treatment and how you're going to apply that in that patient. So what causes a cavo varus? Well, the first thing that you should think about is that 60 to 70% of cavo varus feet have a neurological cause. And this could be something, a peripheral nerve problem such as charcot marie tooth It could be a cerebral palsy, which although the lesion in the brain is static, the actual deformities that occur in the foot are not static. It could be something such as Friedrich's ataxia, which is something we quote in the exam, but we rarely see. It could be a spinal cord injury, a peripheral nerve injury, or something higher up like a stroke. Diagnosing a neurological cause is extremely important to understand the process that you might accept, expect this foot to go through and also the prognosis of the condition and their reaction to the treatment that you might provide. It's worth thinking about whether this is a bilateral problem as well. You will see some feet that are bilateral and this could be charcot marie tooth, it could be uh, a paraplegic or a quadriplegic, it could be Friedrich's ataxia, spinal cord injury, CTV, or MPS. There are also unilateral causes, such as charcot marie tooth, uh, cerebral palsy can be unilateral in a hemiplegic, polio, Friedrich's ataxia, spinal cord injury, CTV, Volkmann's contracture, and stroke. And there are also associated things that you might see during your examination. Are any of the arms affected? If so, is it one arm or two arms? Are the legs shortened? Is one leg shorter than the other? 
is this a champagne bottle type leg where you get peripheral wasting of the muscles but proximal retention of muscle size and that's usually a pathognomonic finding in Charcot Marie Tooth. Is the IQ affected as well? Is this, a, is this a global pathology? So there are a couple of anatomical things that we need to be aware of when looking at cave ovaris. And the first is the perineus longus activity, and this usually confuses people. So the perineus longus is a muscle that sits on the lateral aspect of the leg, so it's a lateral muscle, but it runs underneath the foot towards the medial plantar surface of the first metatarsal. If your foot's not on the floor, tensioning through the perineus longus will plantar flex your first metatarsal and also either the foot. But as soon as you're standing on that foot, due to the fact that your first ray is now plantar flex down, as you stand on it like a kickstand, the foot will rock over into an inverted position. And I'm going to talk about that more shortly. Tibialis posterior tendon is a medially based muscle. It runs behind the medial malleolus uh, to the navicular where it inserts. In a non-standing foot, this will cause plantar flexion through the telonavicular joint and it will add up to the midfoot around the telonavicular joint. In a standing foot, it will actually lift the heel up and invert the heel and it forms part of that action which allows you to lock your midfoot and create a stiff foot for push-off. Mechanical concepts you're going to have to keep in your head when you're looking at the K reverse foot are first of all the tripod theory. A tripod can't be wonky. That's why we make bar stools tripods so that when you're feeling a little bit squiffy after too many beers, you don't fall off your chair. It will always be stable. All three legs will share the force. And those three legs in the foot are the calcaneum, the first metatarsal head, and the fifth metatarsal head. So in the foot, that's how it looks. There are those three points that we talk about. Now, this theory only really stands when you're looking at the foot from a global perspective. If you want to just consider the forefoot, the forces are very different. But when we're looking at a whole foot position, the tripod theory is very important. I've tried to use my hand here to show, and this is what I, this is what I did in the exam when I had to look at one of these. And that was to show the medial arch with my index finger being the first metatarsal, my thumb being the calcaneum and my index uh, and my middle finger being the fifth metatarsal and you can see there a normal foot from a medial side and posteriorly as soon as we plan to flex the first metatarsal what we're essentially doing is lengthening one of those tripod legs towards the floor and then when we wait there through that the foot will tip onto the other two legs and that's how when you've got a plantar flexed first ray the foot will actually tip into a various position with a higher arch and that's because all of the foot is loading through that one kickstand position plantar flexed first metatarsal. If we then look at that same foot from the back as it lands on the first ray and tips into varus you'll actually see the heel come into a various position purely driven by that forefoot plantar flexed first metatarsal. The windlass mechanism is also very important when we look at a cave over foot and as we described before as you go up onto the tiptoes that actually stretches the plantar, fla plantar fascia around the metatarsal heads, tensions the sole of the foot and this elevates the arch and pushes the heel into a varus pulled over by a tight plantar fascia. When you look at a cave varus you need to consider is this a problem of the soft tissues? Is this that the soft tissues are too stiff? Is this that there is a muscular weakness? Is this that, that there is muscular or soft tissue contracture? Is it due to spasticity or overactivity of certain muscles or an imbalance or underactivity of other muscles? Is this a bone or joint problem created by asymmetrical arthritis of the ankle or a previous fracture malunion? In the history, you wanna know whether this has been present since birth or this is a progressive problem. Do they have a callosity or an ulcer on the lateral border of the foot? Is there worsening mobility? Is that their main complaint? Do they have pain from joints which are becoming degenerate? Is there a recurrent instability problem? Or do they have associated problems that are also going on? And also what's been tried so far? Assessing deformity involves looking at the patient as a whole from the global aspect and then looking at the actual foot itself proximally and working your way down. So purposefully make yourself consider the hind foot position, then the midfoot, and then the forefoot. Try and go in an order of inspection, examination, and special tests as we always do. Consider the following as you're going. As I've said before, think about what's causing this, what's driving this deformity. Where is the deformity occurring and what's the deformity specific to this foot? 
and what are the corrective options and whether they're appropriate in this patient. First of all, inspection. Does the patient walk? Get them up and walk them. In a young patient, you can use the GMFCS if they have uh, cerebral palsy. You want to be looking at whether they're using walking aids, whether they have splints and inspect their shoes to look for asymmetrical wear or insoles. Look at their gait. So the gait pattern can tell you an awful lot. If they have a high step, that's to clear a foot drop away from the floor. And then when their heel hits, they will have a foot slap because they don't have that eccentric slowing of tib ant. And that tells you that tib ant's not working or is weak. Are they recruiting their extensor tendons at the toes? So as they try and pick their foot up, can you see their extensor tendons um, uh, pulling on the skin as they try and use their toes to lift the foot? And also are they a toe walker with, with tightness and spasticity in the posterior aspect of the calf? Is it a bilateral problem? Are there associated deformities of proximal, proximal issues in the legs, champagne bottles, arm involvement, such as posturing or spasticity of the arms, and are there surgical scars from previous procedures? Overall, is the leg smaller? Is the, is the foot smaller? Um, it, this, this would recommend to you that this has been present since birth and is more likely to be something such as CTV, polio. Um, look at the skin, the nails, the hair. This can all give you good aspects of whether there's something going on globally in this limb. When you're looking at the hind foot, there are a few things you want to comment on. The first thing is an equinus position. Is the gastrosoleus Achilles complex tight? Is that pulling the heel up and the toe goes down? From the front aspect, you might see a, a, a peekaboo heel, and that's a various position of the heel, which you can see sneaking out from the front. Peekaboo heel purely tells you that the calcaneum is in a various position and is, and is visible. Posteriorly, it's sometimes quite difficult to actually see what alignment the heel is in. So one, one thing I always do is run my thumb down the back of the Achilles tendon and that seems to draw a blanching line down the heel and that can actually delineate whether this heel is straight in slight varus or slight valgus just by running your thumb down the back. Then inspect the midfoot. Is there a cavus, a high arch position? Is the forefoot adducted? So is the forefoot actually beyond the line where you think it would be towards the midline of the body? Inspecting the forefoot is their plantaris of that first metatarsal. So when the foot's off the floor, can you actually see a plantar flexed first ray? Is there clawing of the toes? And clawing of the toes, remember, is that the, the MTPJs are hyperextended by overactive extensors. And are those extensors being recruited when the patient tries to lift their foot? And in that bottom picture, you can actually see these um, bowstringing tendons that are visible over the MTPJs. Always inspect the sole of the foot. Callosities will tell you exactly where the foot is weight bearing. A normal foot will weight bear on the heel, the first metatarsal, and then a shared callosity under the lesser metatarsals. If you've got a large callosity over the fifth metatarsal head or on the lateral border, you know they're putting too much weight through there. Silver ski old test is something that's important in every single foot examination, and that's a test for one thing and one thing alone. It purely tests the gastrocnemius tightness. It's a very difficult thing to explain quickly, and I'm going to help you to do that. So basically, you have to know the anatomy that pulls the heel up, and that's gastrocnemius and soleus attaching together to a combined tendon called the Achilles, which inserts on the calcaneus. The gastroc originates on the back of the femur, so it crosses the knee and the ankle. The soleus originates on the back of the tib and fib, so it only crosses the ankle. So the difference between the two is just that the gastroc crosses the knee. And there's the anatomy. When the knee is straight, the gastroc is engaged. When the knee is flexed, the gastroc is relaxed. The soleus is the same regardless of what the knee is doing. If you straighten the knee and dorsiflex the ankle and look at the lateral side of the foot, you're then tensioning gastroc, soleus and Achilles all together. If you look at the border of the lateral side of the foot, this is a straight surface and this will give you the angle between the back of the leg and the lateral border of the foot. What you don't want to do is look at the medial side because the arch will give you a false reading. Then if you keep pressure on the foot and flex the knee, you're relaxing the gastroc. The soleus, Achilles complex and the ankle motion are all exactly the same. All you're doing is taking gastroc out of the equation. If there is a significant increase in the range of motion and the creases on the front of the ankle, then the test is positive. And a positive test means gastrocnemius tightness. Here's a diagrammatical representation I do it as this shows, so I do it with the knee straight and then I bend the knee and see if the, the range of motion increases. 
And here's a, a picture representation of an ankle in full dorsiflexion with a straight knee and then with a bent knee. You can see the creases occurring on the front of the ankle and that's one of the key signs I look for. That's a much easier thing to look for than looking around the corner at the lateral ball of the foot to see the angle, which is just something that we ballpark. So if you've got a silver ski or positive, that tells you that you've got a gastrocnemius tightness. If you've got a silver ski or negative and there is reduced dorsiflexion, that could mean one of several things. Achilles tightness, Stelaeus FHL or FDL tightness, such as a Voltman's contracture, posterior ankle capsule tightness, ankle arthritis or a previous ankle fusion. If you've got a negative silver ski old test with normal dorsiflexion, you have a normal ankle. So when you're looking at a K-reverse foot, the next thing to look at is whether you've got a passively correctable deformity. Passively correctable means the joints move, so they're not so arthritic they've become locked. The ligaments aren't so contracted that they're locking joints and you've not had previous fusions. So you want to see whether the hind foot varus is correctable. Make sure you bend the knee to relax the gastroc and just see if you can passively shift that heel into a, into a valgus position. Is there a midfoot cavus? And if there is, can you correct that by positioning the heel and pushing up on the first ray? Is there, is there that plantaris which is correctable as well? And is there clawing? So if you actually bring the, bring the MTPJs down, can you correct that? Muscle function is something to look at as well. This is going to be the next part of your examination. So first of all, gastrocilius, you're going to plantar flex. Uh, this is a plantar flexor of the ankle, and you're going to test the strength of gastrocilius and see if it's tight using the silver ski old test. The next thing you're going to look at is tibant. If you dorsiflex the ankle against resistance, is tibant working? Tib post, you're going to plantar flex and adduct the mid foot and you're going to resist against the medial border of the first metatarsal feeling over that tendon which you can feel coming around the back of the medial malleus is tip post working because this might be needed for correction is perineus brevis working get, the, get them to forcefully abduct the foot so what i usually do is i put the foot in an abducted position and then i say don't let me move your foot and then with one finger i'll come towards the fifth metatarsal and try and adduct the foot and invert the foot and if they can resist that perineus brevis is working the perineus longus, I will plantar flex the foot and put it in an everted position and that will bring the first metatarsal down. And again, I'll say, don't let me move your foot. And I will push up under the first metatarsal head and get them to resist. And you can feel perineus longus tendon tension on the lateral side of the foot. Then you want to look for EHL, EDL, FHL and FDL tendons and whether they're working and is the power five out of five. All of these muscles need to be tested because they might be required to correct this foot and it will also point you towards the possible diagnosis. The Coleman block test is something that is, is going to be asked if you get a K-reverse foot and you need to be able to explain this very succinctly and clearly. clearly. This, is, this is a test that's relying completely on the tripod theory that we talked about before. So for that you've got to remember that a tripod can't be wonky. All three aspects of a three-legged, uh, anything that has three legs and wants to stand on the floor won't be wonky. The force will be shared between those three points. So calcaneum, first met head, fifth met head. And there are those points. It's a dynamic test of a K reverse foot. Firstly, stand the patient with the whole foot on a block. Weight bear the foot, examine the hind foot alignment from behind the patient. Is it straight or is it in varus? In a K reverse foot, you'd expect it to be varus. Then what you're gonna do is twist the foot slightly so that the first metatarsal head is just hanging off the medial border of that block. And you're gonna re-weight bear the patient. So you can see now that that first metatarsal is now off the block, but the other two aspects of the tripod, tripod are on the block. If you now weight bear the foot, you're weight bearing through those two other legs of the tripod, allowing that first metatarsal to drop into thin air. Re-examine the hind foot alignment and see if it has been corrected. So here you can see a foot flat on the floor with a varus heel and a foot standing with the first metatarsal free, tipping into a neutral or more valgus alignment. And you can see it again there. A positive test where the heel corrects when you wait there without the first metatarsal on the block tells you two things. The deformity is four foot driven and that means that that plantar flex first ray is actually tipping the foot into a K-reverse position. 
The second thing it shows you is that the hind foot is supple. And that means that if you take away that deforming force from the front of the foot, the hind foot will correct. There is also an aspect of instability in a lot of patients with Cairo varus. You've got a varus position of the hind foot already, and that's already in a partially inverted position. So they're already halfway across to having an inversion injury. So it's very common to have ATFL and CFL injuries. Remember, ATFL is another anatomical thing we're going to have to be aware of in these patients. And that, the insertion of the ATFL actually tips upwards as it goes from the fibula to the neck of the talus. The CFL heads backwards as it goes onto the calcaneum. ATFL is uh, tested with the anterior draw test. And for this, what you're going to do is have the ankle 20 degrees plantar flex and that will bring that ligament which is facing upwards into its most tensioned position. So 20 degree plantar flex foot, then you're going to stabilize the tibia, hold the heel and translate the heel forwards. If they have a big leg or you have small hands, put the foot on the bed and translate the tibia backwards. If you see an increased glide of the tibia over the, over the talus or the talus under the tibia or a sulcus sign, just in front of the fibula, then this is positive. So here is the anterior draw test. And you'd see a sulcus sign just in front of the fibula there as you slide it forwards. And here is the second way, which I find very useful in people with larger legs. And you can see a nice big sulcus and you actually get a bigger range of motion in this as well, especially because the gastrocnemius um, allows, the, uh, allows the foot to slide forwards under the tibia or the tibia to slide over because the knee is flexed. So this is a very useful way to do that test. The CFL runs in the opposite direction. So you're actually going to have to forcefully dorsiflex the ankle on your forearm and apply a varus force to the heel. And you're looking for an equal range of motion to the opposite side or increased, whether there's a solid end point. And if you can feel that CFL tension against your thumb underneath the perineal tendons where it runs. So this is the way I do it with, my, with the forefoot running up my forearm. I hold the heel and I use the thumb of my hand on the heel and put it just underneath the fibula here over the perineal tendons. And as you tip the heel into varus, you will feel the CFL push against those perineal tendons underneath your thumb. And that's one of the aspects I look for. When we're looking at radiographs of a cavo varus foot, there are several things to look at. And this, this is where you can start to really understand a foot on an x-ray as a 3D problem. So looking at just the DP view of a foot, the, do the dorsal plantar view, you can actually see what position the hind foot's in and kite's angle is a very useful thing. In a normal foot, you have the talus sitting on top of the calcaneum, but there is a slight angle to them as the calcaneus goes towards the lateral column and the talus goes towards the medial column. In a flat foot, they unravel and the talus tips off the calcaneum. This is measured by kite's angle and that will be increased in a flat foot. In a cavovarous foot, the talus will be right on top of the calcaneum so you get a decreased kite angle. Kite angle is the angle between the talus and the calcaneum when you're looking at the foot from above. Taylor coverage is another thing to look at, and this looks at purely how much of the navicular is over the talus. If you have a, an uh, increased Taylor coverage, so the navicular is hanging over the medial side of the Taylor head, this tells you that you actually have an adapted forefoot, and this may be associated with tib post overactivity, because you actually have something pulling the navicular immediately. Calcaneal pitch is another aspect to look at and that tells you the height of the calcaneum. That tells you how high that, that um, cavus position is likely to be and if there is a calcaneous aspect to that. Mary's angle is very very useful and this is something that you can generally just eyeball when you look at an x-ray and that's a line running down the, the uh, talus, down the mid body and the neck of the talus and a line running down the first metatarsal and they should be aligned perfectly. So they should be two parallel lines. Normal is from minus four to plus four. Cavus is where it goes more than four degrees positive, and that's where your talus is actually aiming slightly up, and your metatarsal is aiming slightly down. Where those lines cross tells you something else as well. It tells you where the center of rotation angle is. And this is good, good for uh, considering where the deformity apex is in a flat foot or a cave reverse foot. So look where those lines cross, not just what the angle is. Sinus tarsi see-through sign is also useful looking at a hind foot varus. And this is something that's slightly more common in a CTEV type cave reverse position of the foot. 
metatarsal stacking is something that can be seen just by glancing at a foot you can tell whether this is a cavus foot or a flat foot so in a high arched foot or cavus you will see the metatarsals all visible like the picture on the top in a flat foot all of those metatarsals line up a normal foot will kind of be like this so if you're looking from the medial aspect of a foot a normal foot will be like that in a cave of errors position it's almost like a hand facing towards you and in a flat that foot is flat on the desk. Other findings that you might see on, a, on an X-ray of a cave varus foot is something such as a fifth metatarsal base fracture because this patient is overloading the lateral border of their foot, which isn't designed to take that much force. In a CTEV type foot, you will see some other aspects. The first thing you'll see is that the fibula is very posterior in relation to the tibia. That's because CTV patients is a three-dimensional twisting rotational deformity. So they actually have an externally rotated ankle. So they will actually face very, very lateral in terms of their transmalleolar axis. And then the foot rotates through the tail of neck back to face forwards on this patient. So you will see a very posterior fibula. You'll also see an abnormally flattened talus and the tailor body will run straight into the neck and very often the tailor neck abuts on the front of the tibia. You might also see something such as a congenital vertical talus which can present as an extremely flat foot or a very high arched foot depending on the position of the rest of the bones and whether this is subluxed or dislocated. So non-surgical options are always the first thing we're going to talk about and that's going to be an MDT approach. Firstly we need to reassure the patient and diagnose the cause. 60 to 70% will be neurological. Physiotherapy can be useful to stretch the plantar fascia, stretch the gastroc, stretch out the tip post and balance muscles that are now weak. Also orthotics can come in useful to accommodate or correct the position of the foot depending on whether it's a correctable or a fixed deformity. Custom-made insoles, custom-made shoes, a foot drop splint or an AFO splint like the one I'm pictured. Podiatry will be very useful to look after the health of the skin on the foot, such as debridement of callosities, and monitor. And they can also um, they can also access orthotics, and some podiatry services will make those in house. We may also need neurology, neurophysiology, a spinal surgeon, or a geneticist, depending on what you think the underlying cause might be. Then we get to the surgical corrective options of a cava varus foot. So. Option one is, do we need to lengthen any muscles? Gastrocnemius slide if we've got a silver steel positive, and that's where we release the fascia over the gastroc and allow the muscle to stretch out. If silver steel is negative, then we may need to release or lengthen the Achilles tendon to allow the heel to come back underneath the tibia. Is tib post overly tight? Does this need lengthening? Is EDL contracted? Is this causing some of that clawing? that's been there for so long is EHL also pulling the first uh, toe up into the air that needs lengthening. Are certain ligaments contracted and do these need releasing as well such as the deltoid, the spring ligament, the subtalar ligaments and the plantar fascia. Whenever we see a flat foot we think of these structures as completely important but remember that a cavo varus, especially if it's been present for a long time, it is an issue of stiffness and over contraction you can very often release multiple tight ligaments and tight structures in a cavo varus foot and it still won't correct as much as you would expect. So don't be afraid to release these structures if that's needed to get correction. Ligament reconstruction might be required such as the lateral ligaments if they're chronically unstable. And one of the most beautiful procedures in a cavo varus is a tendon transfer because you get a double benefit. Not only do you remove a deforming force of an overactive or uh, uh, tendon which isn't balanced out by um, an eccentric pull but you're also going to implant that somewhere else to get a corrective force but you do need a power that has five out of five or at the very least a good four out of five. This can include something like a tib post transfer where we take the tib post off the navicular, we put it through the interosseous membrane to pass it over the dorsal aspect of the ankle or the anterior ankle and we insert it anteriorly and laterally so it acts as an, uh, a dorsiflexor of the ankle if tib ant's not working and also an active everter. If tib post isn't working you can use FDL but it's not going to be as strong as tib post and like I said before you can get a double correction here if tib post is causing you cavo varus so if there's an equino cavo varus type position 
and there's uh, an adducted forefoot on that dorsal plantar view of the x-ray with too much Taylor coverage, releasing this will allow the foot to come back and then give you some active dorsiflexion and eversion of the foot. Here's some pictures of a tib post tendon which has been performed with splitting the tendon. This is to give a more balanced uh, dorsiflexion of the foot. We can also do a perineus longus to brevis transfer, which is a very beneficial procedure as these tendons lie right next to each other. Very straightforward to pull the longus taut, sew it to the brevis, and snip the longus just beyond where you've sewn it. It does take you about five minutes to convince yourself that you're cutting the correct tendon after you've sewn them together. So it's worth marking one and hoping that the pen doesn't rub from one to the other. It's always a slightly nervous uh, time in the operation. And that can be seen here, and that's it. It's a very nice procedure because it's done through one small incision. We can also do something like an EHL transfer where we take the EHL off the toe, which is causing that clawed position of the hallux. We release that, allow the toe to come back down. We then implant the EHL tendon into the metatarsal neck so that it acts to dorsiflex the first metatarsal if that's a deforming force. If this is a forefoot driven cavo varus, with a supple hind foot. Because we've taken the HL off the toe, we will then need to fuse the IPJ, otherwise we'll get a mallet deformity of the toe. We've still got extensor hallucis brevis attached to the proximal thigh, so we will still have enough to lift that big toe off the floor. Osteotomy is a really useful procedure because we can actually move the legs of the tripod into a beneficial position to help correct the foot. Calcaneal osteotomy can be done with either sliding the calcaneus laterally or doing a lateral closing wedge, which I actually prefer more because it's a more stable procedure. If you cut a wedge out with a lateral base of the wedge and then you actually leave the medial cortex intact, you can actually swing the, the weight bearing aspect of the calcaneus into a lateral position and that actually uh, lateralizes or valgizes your heel part of the tripod and that will actually cause some correction. You can also do a dorsiflexing first metatarsal osteotomy. So you could cut in the metatarsal either parallel to the floor with a dorsal closing wedge, or you can cut through the joint and fuse the first metatarsal TMTJ uh, with a dorsiflexing dorsal closing wedge. You can also perform a supramalleolar osteotomy if there is asymmetrical arthritis or a previous uh, fracture malunion. Here is a lateralizing calcaneal sliding type osteotomy. And here is the, uh, the procedure that I prefer, which is a closing lateral wedge, such as a Dwyer uh, procedure, or a Krakow, I think is the other name for this lateral closing wedge. And you can see there that it actually positions the heel more centrally under the tibia, and that actually lateralizes your weight bearing point of the tripod. Here are some of the dorsal closing wedge osteotomies, either through the joint with a TMTJ fusion, if you think that that's an unstable or an arthritic painful joint, or you can avoid the joint altogether. You can either do it as a vertical closing wedge, or you can do it parallel to the floor, which gives you a more stable closing wedge osteotomy. The final option in a, in a, um, a non-supple, non-corrective deformity where there's arthritis present, or where you've got a very uh, severe correction that's required is to either fuse the ankle if the ankle is driving this varus or perform a triple fusion. Now if you're doing a triple fusion for a cavo varus you have to address the lateral column. This is not a time to do a dipple where you just go immediately and do a subtalar and a talar navicular joint fusion because if you do that you're actually going to swing the foot into a more adducted, more cavus and more varus position. So you are going to have to address all three parts of the triple and you're going to have to bone graft the medial side most likely and take slightly more off the lateral side to get that correction. You may also need to do a fairly substantial midfoot um, osteotomy or a midfoot rotational osteotomy or fusions depending on what that foot needs. So to put it all together one of the easiest ways to do that is to look at a Charcot Marie tooth which is probably one of the more common aspects of a cavo varus position foot. So Charcot Marie Tooth is a hereditary motor sensory neuropathy. And if you can remember that name, then you can talk, you can say everything that you need to say about a Charcot Marie Tooth to pass the exam. And that is that this is an inherited condition 
hence hereditary. It affects the peripheral motor and sensory nerves, motor and sensory in your and then if you want extra bonus points, you can say the main two types are either cause, cause a demyelination of the nerves or a Wallerian type degeneration. It's progressive, it can affect the arms, it affects the longer peripheral nerves first, and it affects the nerves at different rates and by different amounts. So it causes an imbalanced weakness, and this is very important to specify. It does not cause spasticity of certain muscles. It does not cause certain muscles to be overactive or tight. It causes all muscles to become weak, but at different rates. So some will be stronger than others when you examine the foot. So this is a Charcot-Marie tooth type foot, and you might get something like this in the exam and be asked to describe the deformity. So if you were looking at the foot on the left, the patient's left foot, you might say, looking from the front, there's a peekaboo heel. I can see extensive recruitment and I can see clawing of the toes. Looking from behind the foot, I can see a various position of the hind foot, midfoot adduction, and an increased arch. I can see that the first ray is plantar flexed, uh, and I can also see from this side the clawing mix sensor recruitment that we've discussed. It appears as an Aquinas position in this, and then you can go on to examine it. So remember that this is muscles that are weakened by differing amounts. So in a, in a shark over tooth type cava varus, you will find that perineus brevis will be more weak. So they will have loss or very weak active E version of the foot. What they will have is retention of the perineus longus. And remember that this is not strong or overactive. This is just less weak. So you will get that classic plantar flexed first metatarsal. So this will be a four foot driven cavo varus type foot. That plantar flexed first ray caused by perineus longus will give you that arch shape and it will also tip you into varus when you stand on that plantar flex first ray. They will also have a weakened tib ant, so they'll have a foot drop, they'll have that high stepping foot slapping gait and they will also start to use their extensor tendons of the forefoot to lift the front of the foot off the floor when they try and clear the foot in, foot in the swing stance of gait. This clawing of the toes actually causes several problems to do with the cave of varus foot and shark MRI toe. The first thing is it will hyperextend the MTPJs. When you hyperextend the MTPJs, the flexor tendons are being pulled around a further distance, which causes that flex position of the PIPJs and DIPJs. Because the toe is now sitting on top of the metatarsal, Whenever you stand, you weight bear through the flexors and that drives the toe vertically down on the, on the metatarsal head. And this is called the plunger effect. If you have a toe that's clawed and the base of the proximal phalanx is on top of the metatarsal head, it will be driving that metatarsal into the floor when that patient walks. It will also exacerbate that windless mechanism by pulling the plantar fascia, which is inserted to the base of the plantar aspect of the proximal phalanx, round the metatarsal head, which will tighten your plantar fascia more, stiffening the foot and raising the arch even higher. As the heel sits off center, it's in a shortened position. So the gastro uh, soleus Achilles complex will be sitting slightly medially and not in its completely lengthened position. So that will be contracted over time. If it becomes too long, a cave of various foot, sorry, if it's been left there for too long, you will start to get stiff or arthritic joints in that position and it stops being correctable through soft tissues or osteotomies and then you're looking at fusing joints. So starting at the top and working down for a Charcot Marie Tooth type cave varus, you would say something like, I would first assess the gastro soleus Achilles complex doing a silver scale test. If it's positive, I'd do a gastro slide. If it's negative, I'd do an Achilles lengthening. Then look at the heel position. The heel is in a medial varus position, so I would do a lateral closing wedge calcaneal osteotomy. This lateralizes the weight bearing position of the heel, which applies a corrective force through the hind foot. If it's fixed or the subtalar joint is arthritic, you do a subtalar fusion. Working forwards, you then assess the perineal tendons, and most likely you'll need to transfer longus to brevis. So you're going to need to actually release the longus off that first metatarsal, which is going to allow correction number one, which is to allow your plantar flex first metatarsal to come away from the floor. And that will help through the tripod theory. 
you're then going to transfer that to the brevis so you have an active eversion force on the lateral border of the foot. Releasing the tib post again will take away some of that adduction plantar flexion of the medial column force, taking it through the introsseous membrane and plumbing it in the top lateral aspect of the foot will give you some active dorsiflexion and eversion. And then you can consider the forefoot looking at whether you're still going to need to do a dorsiflexing first ray osteotomy if releasing peroneus longus off the first ray hasn't done enough. Are you going to have to lift that first ray up in the air? Are you going to do a Jones procedure? Uh, and are you going to need to balance your lesser toes? And you'll only really know that once you've corrected your hind foot. And that's why we start at the top and work down. So we're going to lengthen the gastrosoleus Achilles complex, either through gastroc or Achilles. That will allow your heel to come back in its corrected position. Then you're going to lateralize your heel. Then you're going to remove the deforming forces and use those deforming forces to correct the foot, such as tip post transfer to the dorsolateral foot and a peroneus longus to brevis transfer. Then we can correct the forefoot. The forefoot's probably the most complex part of all this in balancing those toes and getting them to sit where they want to. The easiest thing you could possibly say is I'll do a dorsiflexing first metatarsal osteotomy and I'll probably need to do um, extensor tenotomies and MTPJ releases. In most toes, that will allow the toes to come down, but you might need to do things like flat to extensor transfer. If we look at that foot we just looked at a, a few seconds ago, we'll actually see on the right foot there are already some scars from correction. So this isn't a case of mine, this is just one I got off the internet for uh, descriptive purposes, but you can see here, this is a perfect type case that you would get in the FRCS. You would say, here is a, a patient with bilateral deformities, they've got a, a cavovarus position of the left foot, and you describe all those things we talked about, peekaboo heel, high arch, with recruitment of extensors, clawing of toes, various uh, hind foot position, uh, and Achilles tightness. And on the right foot, they've had previous surgical correction, you can see three stab incisions from a percutaneous triple release of the Achilles. You can see a lateral base scar from the peroneus longus transfer, transfer to brevis. It may also be that a calcaneal osteotomy has been performed through this incision. And there's also some fourth foot scars, potentially from a dorsiflexing first ray osteotomy or a Jones procedure. And then there's some small scars over the lesser toes, suggesting there's been soft tissue balancing of the lesser toes. So I hope I've given you a bit of a whistle-stop tour as to all the aspects that are involved in a cavo-varus assessment. And you will see that to understand the 3D deformity of a foot, you have to know very well the anatomy. You have to understand the biomechanics of the foot. And you have, you're looking at three or four different models in the foot to talk about a cavo-varus and how you're going to correct it. And then you've got a multitude of surgical options available to you. And you're going to have to design this operation around this patient. Now, we talk about an a la carte operation, um, and it really does mean a la carte. So if you went to a menu, you would order exactly what you felt like on that day. And that's exactly what you do for a foot like this. It is not an algorithm-based assessment. You're going to look at the hind foot and say, how various is the hind foot? How equinus is the hind foot? How calcaneous is the hind foot? How high is the arch? Is this just a vertical elevation of the arch? Or is there some rotation? Is there a, a corrective uh, derotation of the forefoot? Is the first ray plantar flex? Is the talus more covered by the navicular? And you're going to have to use all those x-rays and all those assessments to figure out what you're going to do for this foot. It's not a straightforward thing, but it is a beautiful thing once you start to understand it. I hope I've given you a little bit of an overview and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Mr. G. Uh, that was really nice. Um, although I've done that before, I, there are certain aspects that I've learned, especially this uh, stepwise management uh, plan, which I really, really liked. I have some questions that uh, has been put by the audience. The first one is the, about the Silviskiold test and whether there is any difference whether, when, uh, when it, whether it is done with the patient sitting or uh, lying? Um, there probably is, but the, the only difference really that crosses all those joints would be the sciatic nerve. Mm. So if you're going to do it with the patient sitting, you're going to have some tension on the sciatic nerve. 
So I always, you've seen me in the clinic, Abdullah, I always sit my chair down at its lowest point. And if the patient can get their foot onto my knee, then I know already that the sciatic nerve is okay. Uh, on the odd occasion, when I dorsiflex an ankle of a patient, they might say, oh, it's a bit tight down the back at which case I can do it with the foot in a lower position. So I can take the foot off my knee onto the floor and do it again. So if you want to get the patient on the bed, then yes, that can be beneficial in some patients who have sciatica. Uh, but I don't see it as a problem. I usually do it with the patient sitting. I can do my whole examination with the patient standing and sitting. Excellent. Fine. The other questions they have is uh, about... Uh, the investigation, whenever you get the first case of uh, uh, pescavus, would you always do a neurological uh, assessment and a neurological investigation in the form of MRI of the spine or the brain or any, any such, or, um, or not? You assume that it's been done already? As a foot and ankle uh, orthopedic consultant, it's rare that I would get a referral of a patient that doesn't have a diagnosis. So most patients that would come to me with a cavovarus foot will have a history of uh, CTV type treatment as a child, or they will have Charcot-Marie tooth running in the family. Um, they will have been assessed at childhood uh, because their mum has it, um, or this will be something that's been known about, or there'll be a known cerebral palsy. In, a, in the odd case that I do get where this is a first presentation of a cavoverus foot, then absolutely you would do a full assessment from top to toe. You would be asking neurological type questions. Has your gait worsened? Have you become more clumsy? How has your walking pattern changed? How, how are your other senses? Um, do you have any pain radiating down your leg? And you're going to have to think, is this brain? Is this peripheral nerve? Is this spine? Uh, is this a neurological muscular type problem? So I've seen patients with mucopolysaccharidosis uh, with um, a cavovarus type position and a quinocavovarus type position. Uh, and there are so many different things that present as a cavovarus foot and they're all totally different and must be managed completely independently. But in answer to your question, yes, if, you, if there is no diagnosis, uh, and this is the first presentation, you're going to have to do a holistic top to toe approach. And that may require several months of, I'm going to get an MRI scan of your spine, uh, of the whole spine, plus or minus the head. I'm going to send you to see a neurologist. We're going to get nerve conduction studies. You might need to speak to multiple people before you go anywhere near this foot with a knife, because it will affect how the foot behaves accordingly. So, for instance, with a mucopolysaccharidosis, the muscles don't become spastic, they become stiff. So the muscles uh, still have some activity, but the muscles can't stretch. They become stiff with the, uh, the laying down of the gag proteins within the muscles. So they don't stretch. So your muscles can't, can't stretch out through that Starling's curve to contract back down. So you're going to treat that very differently to something like a Charcot-Marie tooth. Um, and if this is a progressive problem, you're going to treat it differently. If you think you can rely on muscle power to stay there, then you can use the muscles that are working for transfers. If you think that all muscles are going to become weak over time, then you're going to be looking for a more definitive bony option, such as osteotomies or fusions. Uh, the next question is, deformity is first metatarsal driven. Should you always do a dorsal metatarsal osteotomy? Or will you, as in you plan for it beforehand, or will you... Um, go with an open mind and assess how it is in the intraoperatively because you've mentioned this proximal to distal approach. Absolutely. That's absolutely correct. So there is no always and there is no never. Um, you're going to do each aspect of this operation and you're going to see how the foot responds to what you've done. If you release the peroneus longus off that base of that first metatarsal and attach it to your peroneus brevis, that may be enough that the foot will correct. How to phrase what you've said in the exam? So in the exam, you've got in the clinical situation, a patient with pescavus, mm -hmm. and how would you say that I will go with an open mind? How, how would you phrase it in the exam in a way that conveys that you know what you're talking about, but at the same time, you know, you appreciate how complex the issue is? So is my screen still up? Yes. So if we take the patient's left, foot that's in a cavovarus position here 
um, what I would say is, uh, so before me, I've got a patient with um, bilateral foot problems. This patient has a preoperative left foot and a postoperative right foot. On the left foot from a anterior uh, position, I can see a peekaboo heel, a high arch, and clawing of the toes with extensive recruitment. Looking behind the foot, I can see that there is um, uh, bow stringing of the Achilles tendon with a various heel position. Um, and uh, to correct this foot, uh, first of all, I've discussed with the patient what they've tried previously, what their main complaints are, and if they're willing to consider surgical correction. Surgical correction would be in the form of um, a 3D deformity correction starting proximally and working distally. I will uh, do a silver steel test to assess whether this needs a gastroc lengthening or Achilles. Um, if it's positive gastroc, if it's negative Achilles, I will then lateralize the position of the heel using a cl lateral closing wedge. Um, that will give me a lateral position of the posterior aspect of the tripod, giving the foot some correction. Um, as part of my assessment, I would do a uh, Coleman block test. If that's positive, that tells me two things. One, that it is a forefoot driven deformity caused by plantar flexion of my first metatarsal. Two, that the hind foot is supple. If I have a positive Coleman block test, I would then do a perineus longus to brevis transfer. I would see the position of the first metatarsal. If it corrects after this, all well and good. If it does not, my next option would be to do a dorsiflexing closing wedge osteotomy of the first metatarsal. Or if the x-ray showed arthritis of the TMTJ, I would do a dorsal closing wedge fusion of the first TMT to elevate the first metatarsal. Then I would balance the soft tissues of the forefoot. Other options for the first metatarsal would be a Jones procedure. So it's a very difficult thing to, to put succinctly because there are so many options, but it's just having these things available. But you'd have to assess the whole thing and then talk about it from top to bottom. But just Excellent. being able to use appropriate surgical options for a foot like this um, is very important. So the, the key ones you really need to know are you're going to do something for gastrocelaeus Achilles complex. Definitely. That's an absolute you will. <coughs> If the heel is varus, you're going to want to put that into valgus. If your first ray is down, your options are longus to brevis transfer, if longus works. Um, your next option is Jones, if you want to do something dynamic. Don't forget, if you're doing a Jones, you've got to fuse the IPJ. You may need to dorsiflex the first metatarsal through a uh, non-fusing dorsiflexing closing, closing wedge on the dorsal aspect or fuse the TMT if you think that's painful and arthritic, then you're going to balance your forefoot. And they're, they're really the ones that you should definitely know for a cavo varus that's supple. If it's not supple and it doesn't correct on a Coleman block, you want to see x-rays because it's probably got hind foot arthritis, in which case you're probably going to do a triple. That's the easiest I can make it. Absolutely. It's, as you mentioned, it's a three-dimensional deformity. And unless you understand the, the anatomy and the biomechanics, it's very difficult to give answers. Um, something, another question I have here, which is related to the post-op protocol for these patients. Now, I'm assuming that, again, it depends on what you did exactly, because that would, um, the, the aim of the management, uh, have you done uh, first ray as well, as, um, uh, fusion or not? But in general, what is your routine post-op for um, the, the, uh, the cases? <clears throat> so I try and make things as simple as I can. And for most 3D corrections, so something like uh, a cavoverus or a flat foot, I will usually do six weeks non-weight bearing in a cast, followed by six weeks weight bearing in a boot. That's just a general run-of-the-mill thing. When I've got uh, osteotomies to heal, and um, tendon transfers to heal. Mm -hmm. And there, yeah. there are other things I might look at. So there are certain things I can do in a flat foot to speed things up if I'm going to do uh, synthetic ligament reconstructions. But um, on the whole, six weeks non-weight bearing followed by six weeks weight bearing in a boot. Excellent. And for the physiotherapy, when do you start that? And what is the aim of it? It just depends. So it, it really depends. If I've done, if I've gone for fusion, then I'm going to go minimally on my physiotherapy and I'm just going to be doing a little bit of sagittal range once I'm out the cast so the patient can remove it. So if I'd done a triple, I would say six weeks non-weight bearing followed by six weeks weight bearing in a boot. Um, 
and uh, I might get the patient out after the first six weeks and start them doing sagittal range of the motion of the ankle. Um, with something like a, a more complicated correction where I've done transfers, I might want to get those patients going a little bit quicker. Um, so I might actually put them in a boost at around four weeks and just start some gentle range of motion exercises. Uh, but it, it's patient by patient basis. It depends on you know, mm. patient factors, operative factors, surgical factors, lo loads and loads of aspects would, would really come into that compliance and uh, tissue uh, situation and exactly what you did and how, how the feel was during the operation. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, so uh, again, next question is, how would you correct the forefoot adduction? Forefoot adduction is usually driven by tip post. So tip post is what adducts the forefoot. Um, unless, you've got a, unless you've got one of those very skewed feet like a CTEV where the ankle's facing off laterally, and the forefoot is facing very medially. But the usual case is that it's a tip post type adduction. And you'd see this on the dorsal plantar view as a uh, tailor covering. So if I just skip back to that view, you will actually see over covering of the forefoot. So you'll actually see that the, the, the navicular is being pulled around the tailor head. Sorry. So in that one, if they've got a foot drop as well, you've got the perfect option of releasing the tip post from the navicular. And because you actually need to pull it through the, the intraosseous membrane to the anterior aspect and insert it, you are actually gonna to have to take that as long as possible. So it's worth taking off tip post with a sliver of periosteum running down to the cuneiform to give you a little bit of extra length. The worst thing you ever wanna see in the world is when you take tip post off and you can't quite get it to the bone where you want to insert it. So keeping as much length as you can there with a sliver of periosteum and then pulling it through the introsseous membrane onto the lateral dorsal surface of the foot, say the lateral cuneiform or the cuboid, that will release that, that uh, deforming force of the tip post. And by plumbing it in on the top and lateral aspect, it will give you that active dorsiflexion and eversion of the foot. So you actually get uh, a removal of a deformer and an addition of a corrector. And then they're, they're the, the beautiful options where you get, you get, you know, buy one, get one free. Yep. Yep. Beautiful. Fine. Um, I have another question here um, about, shall we do these surgeries just for cosmesis? No, <laughs> no, that's what plastic surgery is for. So I do these, these are big surgeries. Uh, they do not give someone a normal foot. They give someone improved biomechanics. So for any, for any foot surgery, what you're looking for is a stable weight-bearing platform uh, and something that's pain-free and chewable. They're the things you're looking for. So stable weight-bearing platform, pain-free, chewable. So if they walk in and they're wearing Louboutins and they just don't like the look of a certain bump on their foot, uh, then they're, they're not gonna want major reconstructive surgery of uh, osteotomizing the bones, um, uh, releasing tendons and transferring them elsewhere you're not going to get this back to a normal foot but you can improve things um, and so surgery is really for when there's weight bearing issues uh, or when there's um, pain and that pain might be due to the weight going through the wrong aspects of the foot overloading of the soft tissues or arthritis so it could be related to you know fractures and things that are associated with instability um, yeah, the, the people that you that aren't appropriate for surgery, usually the simple task of explaining what the surgery entails uh, will make them realise that this is quite a substantial task uh, mm. for them as well as you. And they will usually self-select and say, actually, you know, don't worry about it. It's fine. I'm quite happy with my insoles. Excellent. There is a question that I didn't fully understand from Cynthia Kumar. Now, I will say it, if you, if you understand it, then fine. If not, then we'll invite uh, Mr. Cynthia Kumar to say it. So, in case of fixed cable varus, painless foot, can mm. we follow non-operative? I, I think he means, can we go with uh, conservative treatment? Of course, of course. So, non-operative is always a viable option. Surgery, in my mind, is a last resort option. So, doing nothing has very few risks, but doing something does put the patient through a substantial risk in the post-operative period. And mm. I only do that if there are clear gains to be made. So there's only, there's only reason to put the patient through the risks of surgery if you think that there are substantial gains that are likely to be made. 
Excellent. So uh, if you have a, a patient who has a cava varus position of the foot and uh, they come see you and say, oh, it's, it's deformed doctor, I don't like, you know, I don't like the look of it. Um, does it hurt? No, it doesn't hurt. It just annoys me. Then you can say, well, let's get you some good, good going insoles and some shoes that fit your foot rather than making your foot fit the shoes. Uh, and let's see where we get to. And a good thing to say to these patients is that surgery is always there. Um, my favorite thing that I like telling the patients is I'm going to be working there for 30 or 40 years, so I'm not going to go anywhere. Um, and uh, they can come back whenever they like and have the surgery, but you can't undo the surgery. So uh, you exhaust all other aspects for an operation like this before you, before you jump for the knife. Excellent. Well, um, thank you very much for your time and your presentation. Um, and I'm sure everyone has learned a lot. I certainly have. Um, thank you again for giving us the time and uh, doing it so succinctly and nice and make it towards the exam.